Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for being here today. I'm Angela Gonzalez. I am the senior reporter at the Phoenix Business Journal. I really am glad to see you all today. And I'm so glad to see you today. Good to see you, too. Thanks Thank, for coming. Thanks yeah, for being here. Thanks for doing this. This is great. So these um, Inside the Reporter Notebooks are basically a chance for me to interview Brian, and you get to see how it, how it goes. And then we'll have uh, time for Q&A at the end, if you'd like. Um, probably closer to about five till nine or so, because you have an appointment afterwards. Yes. Can we talk about what you're going to do afterwards? Uh, <laughs> it would be very uninteresting to these people. <laughs> they would want to. If we, that's, we get into that, they'll want to leave. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let's just start from the beginning. You were president over at University of Phoenix. You were doing well. Stock was just skyrocketing. Everything was going great. Meanwhile. Grand Canyon here was a nonprofit, a, a, a private Christian college that was on the brink of bankruptcy, right, failing. Um, and all of a sudden, you get this call from these investors, and they say, "Hey, how would you like to come and make a make make this college succeed?" What were your thoughts back then? Well, it's interesting if you back up just a little bit before then. You know, we tell our students that that uh, we believe that God has a purpose for their life, and everybody's born for a reason and for a purpose. And if you can find that. Um, your life tends to go better. Um, I spent the first part of my life in Christian education uh, as a student and as a teacher. Uh, I was a high school teacher and a basketball coach, and I was a college professor and a basketball coach. So I, my life was going in that direction, and, and we moved to Arizona, my wife and, and uh, my kids, uh, because I was going to finish a PhD program at ASU and then go right back into coaching. Uh, but I had three kids. I had a fourth one on the way. I was making $5,000 a semester at ASU teaching philosophy uh, as part of a humanities course. And, and so uh, things weren't going well with, you know, I was, before I adopted a lot of my, my thinking about retention. Uh, this is not what my wife had in mind. Um, so I wandered into University of Phoenix in 1987, and they hired me. Um, and uh, I ended up staying there 22 years and running uh, Apollo Group, uh, which is a publicly traded company. So when, they, when Grand Canyon called, it was like I had all that experience in Christian education, and then I had the experience of running a publicly traded education company, even though I've never taken a business class in my life. Uh, I actually ran two publicly traded uh, uh, companies there. And so this seemed to be the perfect, it, it seemed like my background had set me up for this, because this was a struggling private Christian university that needed a new way to do business, because it was about to close and we were going to use the public markets to make this thing work. So when they called you, did they tell you that their plan was to take it public? You knew that when you came, when you came in? Yes. Um, when we got here, there was about 900 students on this campus. There were a few thousand students attending online. The campus was about 100 acres. But Arizona is unique in that we don't have a history of private education here. If you go to California, there are 70 private universities. If you go to Texas, there are 40 private universities. And, uh, uh, Arizona does not have a history of that. Uh, and so we thought the opportunity to build a private Christian university in a state that didn't really have um, much history of that was, was, but we weren't going to be able to do it through the typical means. We weren't going to go out and get $2 billion donated to the university to build up a large endowment. That wasn't going to happen. And so we, it was our determination that the way to do it was to use the public markets, which is very new. It's very different. It's very different, especially to, to do that at a, at a uh, traditional university setting. And so um, they said that that was why they wanted us, that was one of the reasons they wanted us to come, uh, me and many others. And, and, uh, but it was a tough decision, right? You've been at, we were at Apollo Group for 22 years. The market cap of the company at that time was $16.2 billion. We had 400,000 plus students. We had hundreds and hundreds of friends. And so to leave that venture at the peak of what we were doing to come here, because this was a complete and total risk. I mean, this, was, this had never been done before. Uh, it was, there was a huge amount of debt. The campus was in, in disarray in terms of the buildings and, and infrastructure. And so it was a big risk to do this. Exactly. And so when you first started here and you were starting to build this and take it public, what are some of the lessons you learned, uh, that, some of the things that you brought with you from Apollo, some of the things that helped you make good decisions, things that maybe didn't go so well at University of Phoenix when it was in its growth mode? Well, you know, the, the, the biggest thing is that we thought that the future of higher education was going to be a hybrid campus. Um, and that is to have a fully built out campus for working adults who wanted to return to school and go online. 
We had a, a long history of being able to do that well. We were the, really the pioneers in that. We started thinking about delivering education online at University of Phoenix in 1989. Uh, and we had it fully up and going by the mid-90s. And, and so we were really a pioneer in doing that. Um, but we also thought that to endure into the future as a university, you had to have a brand that was built on a traditional campus setting that was rooted in a location. Uh, and so we thought the hybrid campus was going to be something that was um, going to be what a lot of universities sought out, and you can see universities doing that all over the country now. So I think we were on the foreground uh, of that, but we also knew the biggest problem in higher education today is it's too expensive. It's just too expensive. Private universities, many private universities, cost families $50,000 plus a year. Uh, state universities are, are, are having to raise tuition, and, and they're having to, uh, you know, it's so Higher education is too expensive to the taxpayers and it's too expensive to, 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 to families. And so what we believed is to create a hybrid campus where we had a traditional campus rooted in this physical location for traditional students, 18 and 19 year old students leaving high school and going to college for the first time, combined with an online campus, leveraging a common infrastructure. And that was really what was key, is the leveraging that common infrastructure, we could create efficiencies and make this a, a much less expensive. And that's really what's happened. The exciting thing about Grand Canyon today is that the average student on our campus pays $7,800 a year for tuition after scholarships. That doesn't include Title IV funding. So if they get Title IV funding, that reduces that even more. Uh, a big percentage of our students on campus today, in fact, will graduate with no debt. They owe so little money after scholarships that uh, they're paying cash. And so they'll graduate without debt. Um, and, and so. We've made private higher education available to all social classes of Americans, which is, which is a very important part of our mission and what we're trying to accomplish. Speaking of enrollment, we see lots of construction. We see lots of dorms going up right now. Where are you with your enrollment and um, what are your five-year plans and are you able to keep up with the growth? We're really not able to keep up with the growth right now, which is a good thing. Uh, you know, the, when we got here five years ago, there were 900 students on our campus and we had about 100 acres. When we start in the fall, we'll have about 15,000 students uh, and, uh, on our campus, and we'll have about 240 acres. It's not just the 15,000 students, though. It's the new, the, the, our incoming class of students this, this fall will have an average GPA of almost 3.6. 50% uh, will be studying in the natural sciences, and we are starting something extremely exciting in the fall uh, in that we are starting our engineering program. We're going to start with chem, uh, biomedical engineering, electrical engineering, and, um, and uh, uh, mechanical engineering. And then we're going to expand to industrial engineering, maybe civil engineering in next year. But the 15,000 students that we have in the fall will become 25,000 students in four years. Uh, and, and we're on track to do that very easily. Um, and so, yeah, the construction you see behind us is, is four new six-story dorms, 3,200 new beds, and we'll turn hundreds of students away because we just can't build fast enough uh, to, to accommodate the growth. What we're learning is that there is no lack of appetite in this country for families very interested in high-quality private education that's wrapped in, the Christian worldview, uh, in, a, in a Christian worldview perspective uh, if it's affordable. Um, and, and so of the 15,000 students in the fall, about 55% uh, or so will be from Arizona. Another 20%, uh, a little bit higher, will be from California where we're growing very rapidly. And the rest will be from the Southwest, although we're starting to grow in the Midwest. So uh, the online campus is about 60,000 students today and we're going to grow that uh, six or seven percentage points a year, and so the end game will be about 25,000 students on this campus, about 400 acres, and uh, 80 or 90,000 students online. Mm -hmm. And you had mentioned before um, plans to expand out to the East Valley, but then have put those plans on hold. Can you talk about why? Yeah, um, we want to eventually be in the East Valley because there's a, there's a, there's a group of commuter students that would, that, you know, there's a lot of students out there that are fine with staying at home, uh, finishing college in three or four years and, and staying with their part-time job, um, we can't keep up with the growth here is the problem. And so um, we're going to continue to build this out the next two or three years. Watch how that goes. Eventually, we would like to be in the East Valley with probably a commuter campus and probably something that would focus in STEM. 
Uh, so engineering, technology, in, uh, uh, math, science, uh, and it, but two or three years from now. Mm -hmm. And Albuquerque, Las Vegas? Just got back from Albuquerque, uh, was just in Tucson. Albuquerque, Las Vegas, uh, Tucson. They're identical higher ed markets to, to Phoenix, which is so interesting. All of them have a very dominant state university system and a very good state universities. Um, uh, but they don't have much in terms of a higher ed infrastructure on the private side. And so if you look at, well, it, it really, you could add El Paso. El Paso, Albuquerque, Tucson, Las Vegas are identical in that very strong, very dominant, high quality uh, state university, but not a private option for families. And uh, so we have ongoing conversations with them. Um, and there is a chance that at some point we will build um, university campuses in those places. But uh, for the next two or three years, we're really focused just on this location. Okay. So we talked about taking the pub company public and doing well. Like, was it 15 consecutive quarters of? I think it's 17. Dan, 17, are you? Yeah. Where are you? Yeah, it is 17 consecutive quarters of uh, beat expectations and rate or beat beat consensus race expectations. Yes. So everything's going great. You're making money. Your shareholders are happy. And then all of a sudden, you say, "Why don't we just go back to nonprofit?" Let's talk about why. <laughs> Uh, we got bored. Uh, you know, this was just, <laughs> there, was, there was not a lot of f action, and so we thought we'd stir things up a little bit by saying that. Um, you know, it's interesting. Um, when we went public five, six years ago, it was because we needed the money. There, there was no other way for us to build this out. We needed access to the public markets to make this work. I like doing that. I mean, I, I, I'm a big believer in the public markets. I'm a big believer in the public markets applied to education. If our students get high quality education um, and they get it at very low cost and it's at no expense to the taxpayer, uh, in fact, the taxpayers make money when our students pay back their loans with interest, which they're doing at a very high rate. Our default rates are going, are very, very low. If all that happens and our investors get a reasonable return, that's America. We need to do more of that. We should be doing more of that. Uh, I'm a big believer in less government and more private enterprise, and I think you can apply it to education. Um, but we are in a situation where we're competing against state universities and private universities that are not for profit and don't pay taxes. So we're on track this year to pay about $75 million in taxes. Next year, we'll pay near $100 million in taxes. Um, and one of our big goals is to keep this affordable. You know, we've got students on our campus from Scottsdale and from Paradise Valley and from Orange County, uh, from upper class homes, upper middle class homes, because our pre-med program is so strong. Mm -hmm. The national average for placement rate into a medical school is 42%. Ours is almost 80%. So our academic programs, especially in the sciences, are very strong. So we're attracting kids from that segment of society. But we also have hundreds of kids that came through the Phoenix Union School District. Mm -hmm. Uh, that have three, seven, three, eight GPAs who nobody in their family ever went to college and they're in our pre-med program or they're going to start our engineering program in the fall. The greatest amount of diversity that we have on our campus is the socioeconomic diversity, which I think is really, really important. We've got kids sitting. Our average class size is less than 25. So when you're in our classrooms, you get to know the students that you're going to school with. You get to know the kids in your dorms. The professors call you by uh, your first name. Um, but having a kid from this neighborhood with a 3.8 GPA sitting in a biology class next to uh, a student from Paradise Valley uh, and them getting to know each other and becoming friends and, and kind of crossing that divide, I think, is really important culturally. It's really important from a, uh, uh, from a social perspective. Um, and, and so keeping tuition low is important. Um, we decided to test. Uh, whether there would be an appetite from our investors to take a 15% premium, to go out with a bond offering, uh, buy our investors out, and go back uh, as a not-for-profit institution. Um, I don't know if it's going to work the first time around. It may, it may not. Uh, but if it doesn't, even if it doesn't, it's forced the discussion about how should universities be classified from a tax perspective. Because many state and private universities are not purely not-for-profit institutions anymore. When you sign a $3.2 billion TV contract and you're going to make money on that TV contract, there's, not a, there's an element of business there, which I think is good. I applaud them for doing that. But we're not a purely for-profit institution anyway, either. 
you could argue that when we have 25,000 students here, 70% studying in the STEM areas, we're going to be a big part of providing the workforce for Arizona that will attract companies to come here and create jobs. Um, and so the public good is being serviced by what we do. And so uh, we're trying to force the discussion of how should universities be classified from a tax perspective. You know, the, the, the good thing about going not-for-profit is all of a sudden we won't be paying taxes, which allows us not just to keep tuition where it is, we may be able to lower tuition. Um, the bad part of going not-for-profit is it's going to be a two, $2.5 billion worth of debt, uh, which is a significant amount of debt to go to bed with every night thinking about. Um, and so we'll see how it goes, um, but either way, nothing will change about our strategy. We're going to grow the campus to 25,000 students. We're going to keep raising admission standards. The average incoming GPA will continue to go up. We'll continue to build out programs. We have eight colleges. We have 160 programs now. That will grow to 200 programs by the end of this calendar year. Um, and, and so none of, none of our strategy will change uh, if, if whether it works or doesn't work. What are some of the barriers that you've stumbled upon as you had thought about going nonprofit, like um, raising money, um, what the shareholders are saying, what, 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 do, what are you seeing there? Well, the biggest, barriers is the, are, are the, the biggest barrier is the shareholders. Uh, the shareholders um, are very, very bullish on this. They, want, they like making money. Well, they, 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 it's that. There's no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. uh, they, and, and, but let me point out that, that no shareholder at Grand Canyon makes money on a dividend that we pay them as a result of our financial success because we've never paid a dividend. There's a misunderstanding about that. The only way a shareholder makes money with Grand Canyon is the value, if the value of the university goes up. They make money on, on the value going up. Um, but as they look at our model, as they look at what we're accomplishing, and they're especially looking at the market. Interestingly enough, when we went public six years ago, the, the banks that helped us go wanted us to de-emphasize the Christian mission of the institution and wanted us to de-emphasize the value of the ground campus. Mm. Uh, we told them we weren't going to do either one of those, that we were going to emphasize the, 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 the value of the Christian mission to the to society, and we were really going to emphasize the value of the traditional ground campus's reputation for the online student. And fortunately, we were right and they were wrong about both those things. Um, but right now, the shareholders are saying, uh, the market for this is so strong. Why mess with a good thing? Yeah, and, and so there, you know, we, we might offer them a 10 or 15% premium. They've been pretty clear to us in our meetings in the last couple of months they're not going to take it. But it's not enough. Because, because they, they see the, va the future value yeah, of where and, this and, is going. And, and, it, and it's because of the operation of this, and, and it's been successful, but they see the market. What they see is that there's no lack of appetite in this country uh, for parents that want their students educated in a private school setting with small class sizes, professors that know their name, safe campuses, dry campuses, and every class being wrapped in the context of a Christian worldview. So the, the relationship between science and, and, and our Christian uh, worldview, we don't see any, uh, any conflict there. And, and parents are really excited about their son or daughters studying in that kind of environment. So if I write a headline, GCU most likely not to go nonprofit. Would that be accurate? We've said from the beginning that there's a maybe 50-50 chance that this would work. Um, and so I would tell you at this point, there's probably less than a 50% chance that it's going to work the first time. Hmm. The first time. But th times change. Things change. Um, and uh, we've learned a lot. And this still may work. But we, we've learned a lot through this process. We've had great discussions with uh, the new governor with Mayor Stanton, uh, Senator McCain was here a couple weeks ago, Senator Flake has been here frequently. The state realizes that this place has value for the state and not at the expense of the state university system or the community college system. Arizona is blessed with a tremendous community college system in our view. We've got great partnerships going with them. We have a tremendous state university system. In many ways, it's, it's, um, it's, it's, uh, it, it is setting a, um, a target for other states. Um, but we used to lose thousands of kids that would leave the state every single year to attend private universities in California. We're now keeping those students in the state 
as well as attracting thousands of students to, from California to the state of uh, Arizona. Uh, Elliot Pollack just finished a, a, uh, a economic study uh, to evaluate the direct impact that, that Grand Canyon has on the economy in the state. Um, and he measured direct impacts. Um, and he determined that we're worth $1.1 billion to the state on an annual basis, or $11 billion over 10 years, five years that we just completed and five years uh, with conservative estimates going forward. And so, like the great private universities in California, um, private university education still has a really important role to play in the country, and we haven't had a lot of it in Arizona. Uh, now we have a, a one, and, and, and the more choices Arizonans have, the better. Um, and so I think uh, um, the legislature and others are realizing not just the, the educational value, the greater good value, but they're also recognizing the economic value that Grand Canyon can play. And so the discussions that we're having are potentially leading to productive things. You mentioned Mayor Stanton. He's, he's told me he's a big fan of yours. He's, he's really happy to see the revitalization efforts that you're doing here. Let's talk about those. Let's talk about Maryvale Golf Course and the corner over here on 27th Avenue in Camelback, what you're doing there. You know, and, and, and we, see, we see our role, uh, you know, six years ago when we came here, uh, if we could get this thing out public, uh, and we could raise the money. We had an idea as to how we wanted to build it out. But did we really want to build it out here? Uh, we had about 100 acres. Uh, most people would tell you, if you're going to have $400 million to spend, you're not going to spend it at 35th Avenue in Camelback. <laughs> um, that is not probably the place that can get you the biggest return. Um, after thinking about it for a long time, we decided this is exactly what we were going to do because this is tied very closely to who we are as a Christian university and our Christian mission. We believe that we can be an economic catalyst for this part of town and start to reverse the fortunes. What happens in inner cities is that uh, when things start going downhill, the momentum can't be stopped. Businesses move out, which lowers the tax base. Cities cut back services, and so golf, golf courses close, and parks close, and pools close, and and uh, public schools have less support, and so nobody wants to stay. Uh, and the, the deterioration happens rapidly. Unless you adopt the philosophy that you can never cut your way to prosperity, you can only invest your way to prosperity. We meet with the city of Phoenix every two weeks, and that's what we're trying to convince them of. We'll see what we can do. But we're very excited about it, mainly because our students are very excited about it. And so we started to look on the west side of town and said, what are the assets? What are the assets the west side of town has, and can we build a plan to invest in those assets and, and, and quit cutting? Uh, everything that we're going to do on the west side of Phoenix has to be done like a productive business. It has to be done profitably. It has to create jobs. We've got free clinics all over the west side, health clinics. Uh, we've got um, uh, food places. Um, we've got shelters. And those things are helpful, and they're good, and we need more. But nothing changes unless there's jobs. And, 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 and people, so people have to go to work. They have to earn a living, and that changes the trajectory of the family for a long time, and that's very tied to, to education. And so first thing we looked at was 27th Avenue and Camelback. 27th Avenue and Camelback is kind of the gateway to this part of the west side of Phoenix. There was a hotel there that was serving prostitutes mainly and, and uh, drug dealers, and there was a sex shop right in front of it. It was just a terrible way to get off the freeway and start heading west. And, and so we bought that piece of property, about 35 acres. So we're going to put $40 million into that piece of property. We've already started. We're rehabbing the hotel. We're going to make it a very, very nice hotel. We're building a new restaurant. It's going to be run by our hospitality management program, by our students. We're building a convention center there that will have education conventions, church conventions, uh, business conventions. We're going to build a, uh, an office complex that will serve 1,600 of our employees. We took the swap mark, converted it to an office complex. It has 700 employees. Um, and so that is, we looked at the sex shop very carefully. Um, very honestly, it wasn't run or managed well. It wasn't profitable. <laughs> we put an ad out to our employees to try to find somebody that had experience running sex shops. 
Nobody raised their hand, uh, so we shut it down. Um, <laughs> but in 18 months, that is going to be in, uh, a bustling industrial center, commercial center, that's going to have 2,500 people coming to it every single day uh, that will create hundreds of jobs for people in this neighborhood. Uh, and it'll be a gateway to the west side that people will be proud of. A couple blocks down, we've got, you know, 240 acres here growing to 400 acres. It'll be a $2 billion business. We looked at 59th Avenue and, and Indian School and said, you know, that's, that's an asset. I mean, that's a 130-acre golf course that could be as good a golf course as there is in Arizona. We have a golf management program. We have a hospitality management program. So we worked a deal with the city. They were losing $250,000 a year on it. They kept cutting back services, which, which, which is what cities have to do. We said, if you'll let us manage, we'll invest $10 million into it. And we'll, we'll create one of the top five golf courses in Arizona. And we're very serious about that. It's 130 acres. Phoenix Country Club is 100 acres. We, we got the same architect that architected uh, Phoenix Country Club. And he said, it's going to be a Phoenix Country Club on steroids, but it's going to be a public golf course to serve the community. At the, same, uh, at the same rates. We're gonna build a 10,000 square foot clubhouse, uh, all new greens, all new fairways, all new tee boxes, bunkers. It will be a world-class golf experience for public rates. Uh, and it will attract people from all over Arizona. We're gonna take that from 37,000 rounds to 55,000 rounds. We're gonna hire hundreds of people who will work there, including our students. And we plan to make that a very, very profitable venture. Our goal is to make a million dollars a year uh, at that property and then keep investing money into it. Public schools in this neighborhood are assets. They're not liabilities. The kids in the schools are assets. They're not problems to be solved. They're assets to be invested in. So right across the street, Alhambra High School has 2,800 students. Uh, they were a failing school three years ago. Um, they've got 82% um, uh, Hispanic. 90% of the students live below the poverty line, and 40 different languages are spoken in that high school. They hired a new principal three years ago. Uh, his name's Claudio. He's a dynamic guy. Um, we said to him, why don't we build a learning lounge on our campus that will open between 3 o'clock and 8 o'clock every day. We've got hundreds of really smart kids around here who really want to do something valuable to be significant in somebody else's life. We'll train them and pay them $10 an hour to provide tutoring in math, science, and language arts in that learning lounge. Um, any student that wants to walk across the street after school between 3 o'clock and 8 o'clock can be assigned to one of our students who will sit with them for as long as they want to be there that evening and help them with tomorrow's assignment, next week's test. We get hundreds, we got hundreds of kids coming now. You know, uh, three years ago they were a failing school, two years ago they were a D school, last year they were a C-rated school, this year they're 10 points away from being a B-rated high school. They're 10 points away from being a B-rated high school. That's an inner city high school with 90% of the students living below the poverty line. But when their students come across the street, St. Mary's Food Bank gives them a free meal. They can stay as long as they want. They get to know one of our students. So you pair a high, a high school sophomore with a college junior. And pretty soon it becomes not just a tutoring thing, it becomes a mentoring thing. And that student becomes the mentor to that, to, to that high school student and they start to get a different vision for their life. And then, uh, and then people get a sense of hope and things change. And so now we're taking that program, we're extending it to Maryvale High School, we've extended it to Borgade High School, and so kids are coming in the hundreds onto this college campus, meeting our students, giving themselves hope uh, as a high school student that they can become a college student. And if you can get one to come and they graduate and they go out and be a nurse or a teacher or an engineer or a doctor, the family's trajectory changes. We've got a Lopes Kingdom Fund in place now where any one of our students who comes to us with an idea that gets vetted through a group, we will fund their business. Uh, and we will fund their business with two caveats. Number one, it has to be in this neighborhood. And number two, they have to, they have to employ people in this neighborhood. Um, we've got our first two moving. Uh, right down the street, there was a Circle K that we bought. There's two warehouses behind it. We're going to have an auto repair shop in there run by our students. Because uh, we're going to have 15, 20, I'm sorry, 25,000 students coming to this campus, 5,000 faculty and staff coming to this campus. They can drop their uh, car over there and have the oil changed, have the tires rotated, and pick it up after work. And so that's another new business that we're putting in this neighborhood that will hire people. 
You mentioned something about, did you say 400 acres? This is going to be 400 acres? Yes, eventually it'll be almost everything from 35th Avenue to 27th and from Campbell back to Missouri, which would be 400 acres. Now, there's a lot of homes in between that you were rehabbing with the Habitat for Humanity. You're not talking those homes, though, right? Mm -mm. No. That, well, the, the, the Habitat for Humanity is, a, is, a, is another uh, project that our students are hugely excited about. Um, you know, the, the people in the neighborhood see all the construction on, on this campus, and they see the beauty of the buildings and the grass fields and everything. And that's nice, and it gives them a sense of hope, but what about our neighborhood? So we got together with, with Habitat about nine months ago and said, can we do a major project in this neighborhood? And uh, we hammered out the details of it. Um, our tax credit money is starting to go towards this Habitat project, and we got thousands of students that are going to provide the labor. Our goal is to rehab uh, 700 homes in the next four years, uh, south of, of uh, Camelback and north of Missouri. That's what will be the first two, uh, and we've started. Uh, we've got 30 homes already done south of Camelback. Um, uh, Habitat's a great organization. They really know what they're doing. With our tax credit money and our students involved with the labor, it's got tremendous, uh, a tremendous future here. Uh, and so uh, there are some multifamily housing units uh, that we will probably pay a premium for and buy uh, that, that will be involved. And we, and we always help people move if that's the case, but very few individual homes. Okay. Uh, you had mentioned earlier um, STEM. Yes. Uh, your commitment to 70% of the students on this campus will be in STEM uh, educational programs. Let's talk about your STEM Scholars Program. Tell me a little bit about that. Uh, you know, that's the, the, we started that uh, we're, we're, um, this semester, uh, and we have two school districts signed up for it. Um, any student in either the Peoria School District or the Phoenix Union School District that finishes their sophomore year with a grade point average of 3.25 or above in the summer before their junior year can start that STEM Scholars Program. And what that means is they can earn 32 college credits uh, that are a STEM Pathways program into any of the STEM areas. So it can be in science, it can be in technology, it can be engineering or math. Um, if you are a Title I student, you can go for free. Uh, if you're not, the tuition is very low. I believe it's $50 a credit hour. Uh, but we're trying to encourage high school students to get on a STEM track before they go to college. Um, and the program is proven to be very popular. We want to get, our first goal is to get 700 kids involved in the program in the next couple years. Um, many of them will want to transfer to Grand Canyon, but they can transfer to other places. What we really want them to do is get on a track believing that they can be a, a good math student and a good science student, and they can have an engineering career or a biology career. Um, uh, and we want to get them on that track before they graduate from high school. So that program is underway, and, and we're going to work hard on that in this neighborhood. Okay, let's talk about the competition. You know, Michael Crow said a few things about you. <laughs> well, your school. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, the whole idea of becoming a D1 athletic, talk, you know, what that means, and... Um, and why some of those, why, why ASU and some of those in, in their particular pack aren't interested in that? Arizona State, my two oldest sons graduated from there. They really got good educations. Um, they're, they're loyal Sun Devils. Um, we, have been, uh, we have been supportive. <laughs> we don't have any uh, issue with Arizona State University. Uh, they've got excellent academic programs. Uh, they are a tier one research institution that provides a tremendous amount of value to Arizona, uh, a tremendous amount of value. We feel the same way about University of Arizona. We feel, feel the same way about Northern Arizona University. Um, this is, uh, we, we, we're a private school. We have a Christian mission. Uh, and it takes people a while to get used to the fact that we're a publicly traded company. Publicly traded company, part of what we do is just the funding mechanism. It doesn't have anything to do with what goes on on our campus with our students. Uh, and what we want to be evaluated on is not our funding mechanism. It's what goes on on our campus with our students. 
What are, what's the quality of our programs? What is the quality of our instruction? What's the quality of our students? Um, are they getting a good education in a safe environment, in a, in a vibrant environment? And so we're, we're, we, we, I know that uh, Dr. Crow has had an issue with the fact that we're a publicly traded company. And can you run a university uh, as a publicly traded company and, and do the best thing for students? Uh, and what we say is um, any, any publicly traded entity, if it's going to be successful for the long term, has to take into account all of its stakeholders. For us, stakeholders are certainly our students first, uh, our faculty, our staff, our parents and families. Those are all stakeholders. And, and our investors are stakeholders as well. Um, and I'll go back to the same statement. If our students get very high quality education, with class sizes less than 25, of 25, with high quality faculty members, with high quality programs, demanding rigorous programs. We have not raised tuition in seven years. If, if it was only about maximizing shareholder value, we could raise tuition 3% for the next three years and our stock would be 60, not 45. We're not going to do it. Our stock opened up at 12, it's now 45 or 46. Our shareholders have got more than a reasonable return. They've done well. It doesn't need to be more exorbitant than that at the expense of our students. And so if our, if, if, if our students get high quality education, it, it's just, if it's at very low cost, if the default rate on our student loans is so low that when students pay back their loans with interest, the taxpayers actually make money on those loans, if our investors get a reasonable return, we think that is a, that is a credible model. Uh, and, and is it a different funding mechanism than the state universities? Yes. Do the state, should the state universities have their funding mechanism? Absolutely. You know, that, that, that they've got a different funding mechanism. They have a different model. We value that. We support that. But we also think that our model has a lot of validity. And don't confuse that with what goes on our campus. We're, we're, we're evaluated by the Higher Learning Commission, by the Department of Education, by the Internal Revenue Students, uh, by the Securities and Exchange Senate. Uh, we've got all kinds of people evaluating what we do here, and, and, uh, and so we don't need somebody else to do that. We've got plenty of people to do that. Um, uh, one of the things that I've told the governor is that, and, and the mayor and others, you will never hear me say a bad thing about Arizona State University or the University of Arizona. It's counterproductive. It's not good for Arizona. We, we need more higher education institutions not fewer. And I do, I do, I, I will acknowledge that I've criticized Dr. Crow for his criticism of us. It doesn't feel good, but I, I, I wish we could get a common understanding and that stuff could stop. As far as Division I athletics, there are three things important to us around here. Number one, our academic programs and the highest quality academic programs that we can provide for our students. Number two is the performance areas. Uh, this is a very vibrant campus. Uh, we love the performance areas on our campus and our students love them. We're just finishing our fifth uh, uh, theater production this year, over 200 performances. If you don't, aren't doing anything fun this weekend, it's Oklahoma, and I'm telling you, it's really good. It's, it is fantastic, um, and I would highly encourage you to think about doing that if, if those things aren't uh, sold out. But theater is important to us. Music is important to us. Dance is important to us. Our debate team is in its second year, and they're competing all over the country. In fact, they just got back this week where they have another first place finish. Debate's important to us, and athletics is uh, another arm of that performance. We have 22 Division I sports. We're in our second year of transition. Our athletes deserve to have the same opportunity as athletes from every other school. We were invited into the NCAA by a conference. We met all the requisite requirements. We're doing all the necessary steps to get full membership after four years. Again, our funding model shouldn't have anything to do with it. Um, uh, uh, and, and so we, you know, we, we, we're excited about the future with regards to that. And if any of you uh, don't have season tickets to our basketball season next year, I can help you out as soon as this is over. Uh, just, just walk with me over to the arena. It's going to be a great, great year. But, um, you know, we're, we're being fully embraced by the NCAA. We've got fully built out schedules, and, and our students, athletes, deserve the same opportunity as every other student athlete. Um, we played uh, Northern Arizona University uh, in, in a uh, in a tournament game just last week, and it was a great experience. Uh, their fans had a great time. Our, our fans had a great time. Uh, we treated them as well as we possibly could treat them. Uh, they beat us because the official screwed us is the only reason, but the, uh, the, uh, that was a joke. The, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was a great time, and, and uh, 
we think it would just be great uh, for us to, we played uh, as a for-profit institution, we, we played Arizona State as a Division II school, I think 20 different events uh, before we went to Division I. And we think it would be great to compete against them again. We had a debate against Arizona State students here uh, a, a couple months ago. Um, and our kids had a great time. Their kids had a great time. There was a lot of friendly uh, um, uh, chatter between the two. And uh, our athletic teams, our coaching staff would love to compete. So we hope eventually that we will. Do you think the, the public universities feel threatened by your growth? What do you think it is? That they're, you're taking their students? What do you, what do you think? I don't, you know, I don't know. I, I'm, uh, the, uh, the, uh, I, I do think Arizona is unusual. Again, you know, you go to California, there are 70 private universities. USC sits right next to UCLA. Um, uh, and that goes on in every state, um, you know. Uh, and so Air, this is just unusual for Arizona. The, uh, there haven't been, you know, it's unusual that there's no private dominant Catholic university in Arizona. Uh, this, the Catholicism is so strong. There really should be. Um, I just think it's something that's new, and it will take a little bit of time. We're going to be very positive about it. We're going to be very encouraging about it. Arizona needs more higher education infrastructure to build out a workforce that will attract companies to come here and create jobs. And, and, and the more universities that we have contributing to that, the better off we're going to be. I just think it's going to take a little time. Looking at the higher education landscape in general, broad nationally, um, what are your thoughts about Sweetbriar closure? I'm not uh, familiar with it. Okay, we'll, we'll move on then. Okay, I'm um, sorry. That's okay. Uh, just the idea of competition in, in general then on a, <clears throat> for online and oh. for on ground. Competition is good. You know, uh, you know, America is about competition. Our economy is driven because of competition. We got to wake up every day trying to figure out how to get better at what we do. Uh, hire the best possible professors. Uh, offer programs that have relevancy to what the economy needs today. Uh, what programs are those? We're going to add 40 programs between now and January 1st. So we'll have 200 programs across eight colleges. Uh, how can we provide our students with better learning environments, both online and on ground? Uh, how can we continually give them a better and better experience? How can we lower the tuition? How can we, how can we condense the time frame? Um, those are all things that we need to be working on every single day. How can we contribute to the research community? Um, competition makes us all better. Uh, but I think the competition should be friendly, I think it should be cordial, um, and I think we should be encouraging each other because this is more about Arizona than it is anything else. We want to be known as an Arizona institution. We, not, we want to be known as kind of a pillar in the state of Arizona that can help make Arizona a better place. I just listened to uh, some, uh, some people from Indiana. I uh, was invited to a private meeting with two people from Indiana that, that because of some moves they've made in the high school world, uh, basically the K-12 world, they now have a 92% graduation rate from high school in, in Indiana. In Arizona, we have a 60% graduation rate. We've got to work really hard with the high schools, with the community colleges, all of us working together, because we've got to get the high school graduation rate go over 90%. We've got to get a higher percentage of our, of our kids going to college and graduating in reasonable time frames with very little debt so they can enter adulthood with the possibility of a, a bright future. Um, the last thing we need to be doing is fighting each other. We need to be working together for the benefit of all the people in Arizona. Speaking of fighting each other, other thoughts on Common Core? You know, we have a, a large education department. Uh, teacher Ed is a very strong program here. We have 1,000 students in our elementary and secondary ed majors, and we're trying to find kids that want to teach in science and math especially. Mm -hmm. um, that's really important to us. Uh, our education department believes in standards. Uh, they believe in standards and they, and they really believe in, in, in rigorous academic programs with high standards that will encourage students to perform at high levels. And we want to provide as much support to the K-12 system as we possibly can along those lines. Um, if it's Common Core, it's Common Core. We're fine with that. Uh, if it's not going to be Common Core, then it needs to be something that replaces that, that keeps the standards high. That's the most important thing to us. And it especially, it, it, it keeps the, uh, the standards high in areas like math. And math unlocks the future for people in so many areas. 
And we have kids underperforming in that area in mass levels, and that needs to change. Um, Let's talk about your family. I think most of them are working here on campus now, right? Yes, I did say my two oldest sons graduated from Arizona State, but they now work here. <laughs> uh, and so uh, I have four boys. Yeah, they're uh, 31, 29, 27, and 25. And we are very, very blessed and very fortunate to have them all working here. My uh, oldest son played professional golf. He played golf at ASU. He played professional golf uh, for eight or nine years. He's still out there, played in the U.S. Open a couple years ago. Uh, that was fun for us. He made the cut, big tire, beat Tiger Woods. Uh, um, <laughs> and that meant something two years ago. It doesn't mean that much today, but it, it meant something two years ago. Um, and he's going to be the general manager of our, of our golf initiative at Maryville. Uh, my second son works in our business analytics department. He was a finance major at, at Arizona State. My third son uh, is our golf coach, uh, who's a graduate of Grand Canyon. He's our golf coach. My fourth son does administrative things in the uh, uh, copy center, and the, uh, he runs some uh, the mailroom. And uh, yeah, so we're all here. I see him every day. Uh, I don't know how good that is for them. It's good for me, um, and we and most of them live in the neighborhood, so it's it's good to be have that. And your wife? Yeah, she was a teacher for 17 years. Uh, God bless her. Um, I uh, eventually got out of teaching and started making a more of a living so she could take care of our kids. Uh, but yeah, she's over here all the time. We're, we're here three or four times a week. She loves being over here. She was a music major, so she loves our music program and, and our theater program. And uh, she does attend the basketball games and other athletic events as well. So it's, it's great to have uh, the opportunity to share that with your family, that's for sure. That's great. And what about bringing big names like Jerry Colangelo and um, Thunder Dan? You know, I, you know, I can't tell you how, uh, uh, how fortunate we are to have Mr. Colangelo here. Um, we uh, started a relationship about four years ago uh, because of a mutual contact, and, and he agreed to serve on our board when we were struggling, and the future wasn't as clear as it is now. Uh, he is a good board member, not a great board member. He said, Brian, I, I don't have a, a lot of tolerance for these meetings. Um, when you're on boards, you have to vote. I like to decide. And so uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, I got the message, and I said, you know, we need to think of a, a new role for you. And, you know, um, our great. business program was growing, so we said, what if we start the Colangelo School of Sports Business? He got excited about that, really excited about that. That program is growing so rapidly uh, that after a couple years of the Colangelo School of Sports Business, we said, you know, Mr. Colangelo is so much more than, 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 than a sports guy. You know, we all know the Phoenix Suns. We all know the Arizona Diamondbacks. We all know now USA Basketball. But he's, he's got a very dynamic, very successful real estate firm. Uh, he's just been involved in so many things. And, and, and the parallel, the growth of the university, the growth of the city of Phoenix, and the growth of Mr. Colangelo and his career are, they are so parallel. You know, we're thinking right now about a museum to, to honor his life and legacy to Phoenix. Um, he's on our campus a couple times every week. Our students know him. Uh, he guest lectures, and we, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing to watch. I mean, we crowd 120 kids into a lecture hall, and they hang on every single word he says. Uh, and, and, and he brings guest lecturers from all over the world. So the experience our students are getting because of his presence here. Sure, does his name help? Yes. But it's way more than his name. It's his presence and what he brings to the students. And most importantly, how he lived his life. You know, uh, uh, tremendous husband, tremendous father, uh, tremendous integrity. Uh, you know, when you are around him, you realize that when he says he's going to do something, he doesn't just deliver, he over-delivers. And that's what I tell our students. If you spend 50 years of your life over-delivering, you will make deals as easily as he does. And that's why he makes deals so easily. So for him to have here, him, him, for us to have him here, is an unbelievable blessing for us as an entire university. Um, Dan Marley, um, when the Suns uh, kind of uh, passed him by for their head coaching job and he resigned, he started showing up at our game, sitting in the front row. And so I called uh, Jerry and I said, Jerry, does he have a resume in his back pocket? Uh, is he interested? And, um, and so he called uh, Dan because you know, he drafted Dan. They have a great relationship. And he said, I would be interested. So we had a series of interviews. And I said to him, I said, you know, you're not going to be getting on a, on a private jet and flying to South Beach with millionaires. 
you are going to be getting on Southwest Airline <laughs> with 12 college kids and flying to Chicago when it's five below zero. Uh, do you really like college kids? That's what I need to know uh, because you're going to spend your life with them. And they're fairly unpredictable when they're 19 years old. Uh, I was a college coach. I know about that. Um, but I, I, it's, uh, that's the bottom line. Um, the NBA is the NBA, and there are good things about the NBA, but in, in, this is an educational experience. This is a chance to mold and shape kids and build a program uh, where you're not just a basketball coach, you're an educator. And you're teaching, you, you know, I tell you, the first year here, kids were a little scared of him. I mean, it, it, he's, he's, uh, the intensity that he brought to his professional career, he's bringing to this. And he expects the same out of them as he expected out of himself. And so uh, they, they've gotten accustomed to him now. And uh, he's going to be a star. He's going to be, a, 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 I believe, a superstar NCAA Division I basketball coach. He's got tremendous charisma. He's a fantastic teacher. Uh, uh, the, kids liked, the kids like him, they gravitate uh, to him. Um, and so another couple of recruiting classes and, and we'll be tough to deal with. Uh, we're, we're excited, you know how I feel about it. You know, I've said this many times. The marketing opportunity is tremendous. Just think, if, if Grand Canyon would play Arizona State in basketball, we could, so Grand Canyon University is a Christian university on the west side of Phoenix. And we have the Arizona State University Sun Devils in Tempe. We could have a game down at U.S. Airways Center. We could advertise that game for 40 days and 40 nights as the Christians against the devils. And I think that would sell out. We'd all make a bunch of money, and the, kids and the, and the Valley would have a great time. So pass that on if you get a chance. I, I think the Christians against the devils has tremendous opportunity. <laughs> That's great. Great idea. Any questions? Yes. I'm Rich Nickel with College Success Arizona. So, hi, I'm Rich Nickel with College Success Arizona. So speaking as a, uh, a leader, a higher education leader in the state, um, talk to us a little bit about, you know, if you were governor and facing some of the challenges he has with the budget and, um, you know, different higher education policies we have right now in the state, what would you do to increase attainment, especially for this opportunity group uh, that you talk about of kind of um, diverse, low income, you know, first generation kids need to get in the game. You know, I, I can't speak to really policy uh, and, and uh, one thing I'm fairly certain of is that I will never be the governor facing that issue. Um, I think we got a great governor though. I think, we've got a, I, I think we've got a really good person for this time in our state's history. He needs to deal with all of his challenges around the state uh, university system and funding and, and all that. Um, all I can tell you is that, uh, that uh, we want to be a big part of the future of Arizona from that standpoint. Um, and we've got a financial model now that can stand on its own. I think it's stable and scalable uh, for 20 years out. Uh, I think what, uh, that we're, 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 we're raising our admission standards. The average incoming GPAs are getting higher. We, we don't do remediation here. The community college system is, is uh, doing a fantastic job with a lot of that. We need to work with them, but we really need to work with the K-12 system. I mean, the, 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 uh, this STEM scholar program is a, an example. Um, the closer the universities can work with the K-12 system in a myriad of ways, uh, the, the, the stronger we'll be to, uh, together going into the future. Um, higher education is too expensive uh, in one sense because it takes too long. Students should not be taking five or six years to complete bachelor's degrees. If we would cooperate with the high schools uh, in, a, in, in a more thorough way, I think we could get to the point where kids could graduate from college in three years, where they could come in. We want as many of our students as we can get coming into the university with at least 30 college credits. There's no reason for really strong 383940 students to repeat in the first two years of college what they've done in the last two years of high school. All of that inefficiency needs to be eliminated from the system. That's a way to reduce cost. It's a huge way to reduce cost. Every time a student has to take five years instead of four or six years instead of four, it's more expensive from everybody. And so, uh, you know, another part of that, though, has to do with the quality of the teachers we're putting in our K-12 system. We're very determined around that, um, especially science and math. 
the sooner we can get first, second, and third graders down a path where they believe they can unlock the complexities of math and science, and we can get them excited about that. Uh, we can get excited uh, for them to study those areas in high school, come out with 30 to 60 college credits. There's a lot of expense that can be eliminated from the system by going in that direction. We want to be a big part of, of the solution to that. That's great. I think it's almost time for you to get going, but maybe one last question. So I'm wondering if the recent reduction in the state budget to the state's universities actually worked to benefit GCU. Um, I, don't, I don't think so. Um, the, uh, the state universities are just as, as determined as we are to build inefficiencies to keep tuition low. I know that's as big a priority for them as it is for us. Um, they have their own a set of challenges like we have our own set of challenges. Um, and, and I hope that they can continue to keep tuition low. I hope they can continue to seek out uh, efficiencies so they, so they can uh, reduce their dependency on tax dollars uh, so that we can get more kids in higher education, we can get more kids graduated. Um, so I, you know, we, uh, the path that we're on in terms of growth here um, is, was started a couple years ago and I'll tell you right now, uh, regardless of what happens there, we can't stop it. Um, the, the, the building that's going, this is our build, biggest building year ever. You know, we're, we're putting $200 million worth of educational infrastructure onto this campus this year alone. Classrooms, laboratories, dormitories. Um, and um, the, the, so the, what is offered here and the value proposition for families um, is, ir ir is ir it, it, it's there irrespective of what happens to our state universities. The bottom line is we need more kids going to college. We need more kids going to college in Arizona. We need less kids leaving Arizona to go to college. We need to keep that intellectual talent here. So I think um, uh, we would, we would, we, we would, we're going to love it if they continue to grow and we continue to grow and um, others join us. Um, that's uh, that, that's going to be uh, better for the future of Arizona. Great. Thank you so much. Yep. Good to see you. Great Good to job. see you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you, everybody.